Today we're going to be making the final modifications to the vacuum electric power assist brakes on our project car. In the previous video, we built a low cost solution to restore the power assist brakes on the diesel powered Honda inside. Overall, the results were positive, however we did discover a few areas where improvements are necessary. So this is the hardware that we ended up using. Actually, this picture gives you a better idea of all the parts. Now, if you haven't already seen the previous video, well, I recommend it. If you wanna see how all this stuff fits together and how it works when we bench tested the various components. Anyway, everything you're looking at was a grand total of just over a hundred bucks. Yeah, it's an inexpensive system, and that was the idea. There are more expensive solutions available, including fully engineered kits, but that's not what we do on this channel. Nope, whenever possible, we build our own stuff, and we absolutely positively try to keep it as inexpensive as possible. Anyway, the first time we tested the system, it worked exactly as expected. The system initially ran long enough to build up a reserve of vacuum in the booster, and after pressing the brake pedal a few times, well, the vacuum dropped enough to trigger the pump to come on, and that replenished the vacuum in our brake booster. The only real issue was, after the system completed building up enough vacuum for the next application of the brakes, well, the pump relay started to chatter, and that's no good. Now, despite the problematic chattering, the power assist brake stopped the car perfectly in the garage and out on the open road. So overall, we were happy with the performance, but we still had that annoying chattering issue. So today we're gonna make some fixes and we'll also talk about some ideas that the viewers sent in. Okay, so this is the exact schematic on how we wired the power assist brakes. Real quick, this is the brake pedal, the booster, and the master cylinder. Over here we have the vacuum pump, a relay to drive the pump, and right here is the vacuum switch or sensor. This switch will detect when the vacuum in the system drops below a certain level, and once that happens, the switch closes and the vacuum is quickly regenerated. Now, as I just mentioned, this switch is actually connected to the vacuum line that I have pictured here. The chattering that we hear is actually the switch opening and closing because the vacuum in the system is almost exactly at the point where the switch gets triggered. So in other words, the on-off position of the switch is a lot closer than we'd like it to be. And unfortunately, that's built into the switch and there's nothing we can do about it. So let's watch some home-brewed animation of what's actually going on. Oh, I should mention this. When this switch closes, it commands the switch in the relay to close. That's obvious for folks who can read a schematic, but perhaps not as obvious if you don't have an electrical background. Anyway, of course I animated this switch, but I didn't animate this switch. And that's because this is more of a South Park animation than a Walt Disney animation. Anyway, the problem we're having is, the pump is shutting off exactly as the vacuum reaches the threshold where the switch commands the pump to turn off the relay. You see, this switch can go either way for a few moments, and that's evident with the chattering that we're hearing. So my solution was to install a time delay relay that would keep the pump running for a short while after the switch opens. This will increase the vacuum in the system above the threshold where the switch is a bit flaky. It's simple and it gets the job done. Now, for the nitpickers, this ain't a proper schematic, and later in the video I'll show you how it's all wired. Now I did read the comments and an overwhelming amount of people suggested that we install a vacuum reservoir in the system to stop the chattering. My problem with that is, well, we would still have the same situation even if we had the extra vacuum tank. You see, the pump would only run long enough to evacuate the tank and this area of the brake booster. Now once the switch triggers the pump to shut off, the switch would still be in the zone where it would command the relay to turn on and off and we would still have the chattering. The only advantage to putting in a reservoir is we would have extra capacity and the brake booster would have plenty of vacuum to apply the brakes several more times without the pump coming on. Meh, that's fine if you're thinking about building a similar system, but for our car we don't need the extra capacity. Because it's not the capacity we're trying to fix, it's the fact that the switch is chattering with the current capacity, which is plenty when you consider this side of the brake booster is our vacuum tank. I hope that makes sense. Now I did see several comments from folks suggesting that we eliminate this switch entirely and use the brake lamp switch to trigger the relay. Of course we'd also have to add a diode to prevent the backflow of electricity. And we'd have to do some simple changes to the way the relay is wired. Well, unfortunately this won't work. 
Sure, it'll turn on the vacuum pump when the brake pedal is pressed, but keep in mind, if the system was wired like this, there would be no vacuum in the system until the brake pedal was depressed and the pump started running. As a primary circuit, ah, this isn't any good. However, as an emergency backup circuit, this would definitely work. But due to the delay in building vacuum in the system, the brakes would initially seem non-existent and within a few seconds, enough vacuum would build up into the booster to amplify the driver's input and the power assist would start working. Look at it like this. If you're driving along and for some reason you decide to stop, well, naturally you would press on the brake pedal. And because there's no reserve of vacuum in the system, you would have to put all your body weight into pressing down on the pedal. Of course, that would turn the pump on. And as the vacuum started to build, well, the power assist would gradually get stronger and stronger. But at the same time, you're still pressing down on the pedal with all your strength. Well, that would likely cause the wheels to lock up because the amount of effort you initially applied to the brakes is now being amplified by the booster while the vacuum in the system builds up. Of course, I don't like this idea at all, but there is something that could be done. If we swap this relay over to a time delay relay, well then pressing on the brake pedal once while the car was sitting in the driveway, that would run the pump long enough to build up a reserve of vacuum in the system. And from that point, as long as we were using a time delay relay, the brake system would always be fully charged with vacuum. And we could repurpose this switch to sound an alarm if the vacuum in the system were to fall below a safe level. This would actually work in a perfect world, but if there was a leak in the vacuum system, well, the alarm would come on and you'd have to tap the brake pedal momentarily to recharge the system, and that's when things start to get a bit sketchy. Of course, another thing to consider is, in heavy traffic where you may be riding the brakes as you inch forward, the pump would always be on. For our car, well, that's not really an issue because there ain't any traffic out here in the hinterlands. But in a more congested area, having the pump running all the time when the brake pedal was pressed is not ideal. But that may appeal to some folks. It's just not anything we're going to do. All right, let's go to the bench and do a few experiments. All right, we have the power supply set up and we trotted out my old school Tektronics oscilloscope. This wire is 12 volts positive and this one's ground. Let's get started. Okay, fast forward a few minutes and I wired up a simple circuit. Now, even if you have some basic knowledge of DC circuits, you may actually find some of the next few experiments interesting. Because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. I'm using an old fuel pump to simulate the pump we're using on our power brakes. It's a reasonable load and I'm not too concerned about running the pump dry because like I said, this one's seen better days. Anyway, when I connect this ground wire to the control side of the relay, the relay energizes and switches the power on for the fuel pump. It's a simple circuit and I just wanted to get everybody on the same page. Alright, our goal is to get this pump to run longer than the command signal is telling it to do. The simple solution to some folks is to put a capacitor across the control side of the relay. Now, theoretically the capacitor will hold an electrical charge for a few moments after the power is disconnected and that should keep the relay energized for a few moments. Let's see if that's true. This is a 470 microfarad capacitor and in the electronics world that's a fairly big number. I'm going to place this capacitor across the control side of the relay and let's see what happens. A capacitor this small doesn't do anything to extend the time the relay is on. You know, it might have an effect, but it's likely in the micro or millisecond range. Nope, I'm afraid to extend the time the relay stays energized. We would need a huge capacitor. The problem when scaling up the size of the capacitor is the instantaneous current or inrush current that's required to charge the capacitor. In all likelihood, a capacitor large enough to hold this relay in the energized state would draw enough inrush current to damage this micro switch. Eh, it's all in the math. So the best solution to extend the time the relay is on is to use a programmable relay, like this one. So in a few moments, we're going to be setting this one up. But before we do that, I want to try something else, and that is to use a solid state DC relay with a capacitor across the control side. You know, I'm not sure anybody recommended this, but since I have a solid state relay on hand, let's give it a shot. All right, I got everything wired up, and we're going to use this solid state relay to drive this mechanical relay. I know, that may seem redundant, but I'll explain why after we do this test. Let's give this thing a taste of electrons and see what it does. Hell yeah! This actually extends the time the pump runs after the command signal's removed. Let's try putting a second capacitor in parallel across the input side of this solid state relay. This will double the capacitance and should extend the runtime even more. 
And yep, it does. This would certainly be enough to stop the chattering issue that we're having. Solid state relays are definitely cool to play with, but keep in mind this relay is rated at 60 amps peak current, but if you read the fine print, this relay is only able to carry 42 amps continuously with a resistive load. Now, our vacuum pump's not a resistive load, it's an inductive load. So the capacity of this 60 amp relay is actually derated to a mere 12 amps if you want the relay to survive. In the previous episode, we discovered the vacuum pump draws an inrush of 12 amps and it quickly settles down to 5.5 amps. So this relay would probably work and solve the chattering issue. The only problem is I want the vacuum pump to run for 5 seconds after the command signal is released. And that's because the brake booster on our Honda Insight has a very minor vacuum leak. Anyway, another issue with this relay is it's a cheapo and more or less a universal DC solid state relay. And I'm not sure what kind of circuit protection architecture is being used inside this thing. I'm thinking at this price point it doesn't have any. Now, speaking about circuit protection, let's take a look at why we need circuit protection. So this is a standard automotive relay that's commonly found on a lot of cars. Let's take a look at the garbage, as far as noise goes, that this relay generates when it's cycled. And for that, we need an oscilloscope. So yeah, these common automotive relays generate a bunch of electrical noise. Normally, that ain't a problem, because automotive engineers are well aware of this, and basically everything on a modern car has protection circuitry embedded into the design. Unfortunately, on our car, all the relays that I'm using are actually starting to cause problems. So, we're going to be upgrading all the relays to relays with snubbers built in. This diode snubber's there to make sure when you shut off the relay, the sudden surge of voltage that's released from the electromagnetic coil inside the relay won't harm any other electronics that may be in the same circuit. It's a safety cushion that absorbs extra energy, keeping everything safe and sound. The addition of the snubber diode will more or less eliminate any transient voltages in the electrical system. Now, right now, meh, probably not a big deal, but down the road when we're going to be adding some microprocessor-based systems to the car, well, these snubber relays will come in handy. Speaking about microprocessor-based systems, well, I reckon our programmable relay has a microprocessor. Now, that's not unusual. You see, microprocessors are in everything these days. You know, that's how the government keeps track of everybody. Alexa, are you spying on me? No, I'm not spying on you. Anyway, off camera I went ahead and programmed this programmable relay, and as you can see, I set it to have a 5.1 second delay. Yeah, I should have made it an even 5 seconds, but that's close enough. So if I touch this trigger pin with a 12 volt signal, that immediately turns the relay on and starts the countdown timer. And as you can see, this LED is on, and that means the relay has been energized. And 5.1 seconds later, it shuts off. Now if I touch and hold the 12 volt probe to the trigger pin, that will of course turn the relay on, but the countdown timer doesn't start until I release the trigger signal. When I trigger the relay and the timer starts, if I re-trigger it, well, it'll reset the timer. This is exactly what I wanted. Let's do a quick experiment to verify it works. Off camera I made the necessary connections. I have this programmable relay triggering a larger relay, and that's because the programmable relay is only rated for 5 amps. Now I also have a vacuum switch wired into the circuit, and the switch is connected to a handheld vacuum pump, and it looks like we have about 23 inches of mercury worth of vacuum in the system. Now as soon as I release the vacuum from the handheld pump, that will cause the micro switch to close, and that'll send a 12 volt trigger signal to the programmable relay, and that should turn on both the programmable relay and the larger relay. And vacuum released. Yup, it works. Now if I give the handheld vacuum pump a few pumps, that should build up enough vacuum to open the contacts on the vacuum switch, and that should start the countdown timer. Let's try that again. So in case you're wondering, I'm holding the programmable relay in the right position for the camera, otherwise the countdown timer is hard to see. Anyway, this system works perfectly on the bench, let's try it out on the car. So for this quick test, I have everything spread out so we can see everything in case there's a problem. The wire lengths are pretty long because most of this stuff's going to be mounted inside the car, but it'll stay nice and dry. 
But for now, everything's a bit messy. Let me get this camera mounted and we can give it a quick test. So there's the programmable relay. I reckon we should zoom in on it. All right, let me pump the brakes. Yep, everything works just like before, but this time around we've completely eliminated the chattering. Now since the previous video, I've replaced the vacuum switch with an adjustable switch and it's set pretty high. With the addition of the time delay relay, we're also putting a little bit more vacuum in the system. Again, in the previous video we were running close to 15 inches of mercury and now I'm pumping the brake booster down to 25 inches of mercury. The only issue is there's a very slight vacuum leak in the booster and after about a half hour it bleeds down enough to re-trigger the pump. But there's no chattering. Once that pump turns on, it takes care of business until it's totally evacuated the system. You know, the vacuum leak in the booster, I figure it's something that might have happened since the booster hasn't been used for a couple of years. And before I start chasing problems, I'm going to see if it'll get better all by itself. We may just have to have some vacuum in the system for the seals to settle down. But keep in mind, on most cars, the brake booster shouldn't leak, and they should hold vacuum for a couple of days if not weeks, sometimes even months. So we'll keep an eye on it, and I don't think it's a big deal right now. Anyway, let's look at the final schematic and how this system is built. So this is the modified schematic of the system we built. Let me run you through it, and this time I'll fully animate the schematic. This of course is the vacuum pump, and this is the vacuum switch. The delay relay is right here, and this is the updated relay with the snubber diode. Anyway, let me animate this. Right now, the teal color is indicating that we have plenty of vacuum in the system, but once I press on the brakes a few times, the vacuum drops and causes this switch to close. That sends a trigger signal to this timer relay, and it immediately closes this switch. Of course, that commands the switch in this high power relay to close, and now we're sending power to the vacuum pump. And the vacuum in the system is replenished. Once this switch opens, it removes the 12 volt trigger signal and causes the timer in this relay to start counting down. And five seconds later, this switch opens. And that allows this switch to open, and the vacuum pump turns off. So letting the vacuum pump run for a few seconds after the switch opens, well, that puts a little extra vacuum in the system, and that helps keep this switch way above the switching threshold. And the chattering is completely eliminated. So it would be nice to combine this timer and this power relay as a single unit, and that would greatly simplify this circuit. But finding a low-cost time delay relay is really difficult. Now a few people have suggested that I look at Automation Direct, which I'm very familiar with. However, they don't have what I'm looking for in the voltage range of this system. I think for now this will be fine. Anyway, these are the parts we started off with. This vacuum switch was not compatible with the way the system was wired, so the switch went into my junk box, but we kept the mounting base. We ended up screwing a brass nipple into the base and then connecting this switch to the base with a rubber hose between them. This relay was fine, but we ended up getting rid of it and replacing it with a relay with a snubber diode. And finally, we used this programmable time delay relay to tie it all together. Between the vacuum switch, the relay, and the timer, we added an extra 50 bucks to this low-cost project. And that makes a grand total of about $150 to build this system with off-the-shelf parts. So this is the completed system with all the wires tucked away nice and neat. Off camera we tested the system out on the road and it works perfectly. So I'm calling this one a success and I think I need to start working on the next project which is the supercharger installation. I'm sure a lot of you folks are looking forward to that one. Anyway, it looks like I'm going to be busy for a while so I guess it's time to get going and we'll see you next time. Until then. 